Guys, we've reached a verdict in the Rebecca Grossman case. Welcome to part two. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chelsea J and this is my channel, Crime Light. I actually have three channels, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. On Spotify and Apple, I release content that I do not feature here. So be sure to check out my podcast, Crime Light the Podcast, and come follow me on Instagram for more personal things. Two weeks ago, I released part one for the Rebecca Grossman trial. I talked about the story that was not receiving much media coverage, and I'm still not sure why, because this case had everything to do with the choices of drinking, speeding, and being on medication, cheating, having money, and lives lost. And the choices that society makes and sadly most likely will continue to make in choosing to have an affair, get behind the wheel and think, it's okay, just this once. Whatever it is, it is not going to happen to me. So we covered part one regarding this story and I linked the content down below so you can catch up on where the prosecution stopped and defense was starting. So I'm just going to recap the crime and I'm going to be adding in some more details. Sometimes it'll be in the prosecution side, other times it's just gonna be right where we left off. So recapping the crime. Tuesday, September 29th of 2020, a crash was reported near the intersection of True Inferno, Canyon Road, and Saddle Mountain Road. Rebecca Grossman was said to be 57 years old at the time and she was arrested on suspicion of vehicular manslaughter. 11 year old Mark had been hit by a vehicle and succumbed to his injuries and was pronounced deceased at the scene. Eight-year-old Jacob was transported to the nearby hospital where he was pronounced deceased a few hours later. Rebecca Grossman had floored her high-powered Mercedes SUV on a quiet residential street, speeding up to 81 miles per hour and barely breaking before fatally striking Mark and Jacob in a Westlake Village crosswalk. And this was testified at the murder trial by a veteran crash investigator. So the going as fast as 81 miles per hour was then reported that it was more like 73 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone where she tapped her brakes a second and a half before slamming into the two minors. And this was testified by Michael Hale, an investigator with the Orange County District Attorney's Office who analyzes vehicular homicide data. So what happens next? What was said was that Rebecca never stopped. The mother said this, all details of the accident indicated this. She had been found up the road and her Mercedes had actually coasted to a stop. So once her vehicle was in an actual stop, in a conversation with an operator through a Mercedes Benz service following the crash, Rebecca Grossman said she didn't know she had hit anyone and that she was driving when her airbag exploded. She said, I don't know what I hit. And that was in a recording with a 911 operator when the 911 operator allegedly asked, do you know if you hit someone? Well, Rebecca would end up coming out later and saying that this was not her. And she ended up hiring an attorney to represent her in the case. We covered that in part one, the video that I did two weeks back. She was basically painting herself as a victim of circumstance through her defense team. They were saying on her behalf that someone else had done this. Rebecca's vehicle was allegedly not the first car that hit the boys. Now using information from the black box inside Rebecca Grossman's vehicle, an event data recorder that depicts information such as speed, brake usage, and airbag deployment, Michael Hale testified that the last five seconds of Rebecca Grossman's travels the night of September 29th of 2020 were captured before a collision had triggered her airbags. Michael Hale would say, because of this, what the black box had shown, the data is consistent with two strikes with small objects. And this was so key for the trial because when someone is saying, it wasn't me, I didn't do this, I was not aware that I hit something, I don't know what happened, that's why I kept going. When they're insinuating something like that, then of course the investigation is going to be taking place, right? And so that's what Michael Hale had to say. This shows us that it was her, even though her defense team was saying 
it wasn't. So when Michael Hale was testifying, he showed a chart with data regarding the SUV's black box. And that indicated that had Rebecca been traveling the 45 miles per hour speed limit, she would have driven the 326 feet in five seconds as opposed to the 559 feet that she actually went. The timing, he said, would have allowed the two boys, Mark and Jacob, to make it safely across the intersection. Ultimately, had the vehicle been following the speed limit, there would have been no crash. That's what he testified. Now, as we're aware from part one, Rebecca was romantically linked with a man by the name of Scott Erickson. At some point in the trial, it had to come out that they were seeing one another because there was some kind of conflict with if he was the one that hit them or not. And so what came forward was the fact that he was definitely there that night because she was playing chicken, is what they called it, racing with him. And so there really wasn't a chance that he wasn't there that night. It was said that they were driving to Rebecca Grossman's house in separate vehicles as they were racing one another through the crosswalk. September 30th of 2020, the Acorn released a statement that Rebecca was arrested on suspicion of vehicular manslaughter and driving under the influence. And she was also being accused of fleeing the scene of the accident. Now, all of this happened on a Tuesday evening, but by early Thursday morning, Rebecca Grossman was out on a $2 million bail, just like that. And one of the things that Rebecca had said the night of all of this happening that I personally will never forget regarding this case is how her husband was affiliated with the Grossman Burn Center and that he could help the victims. The whole, I can fix it, like that attitude almost never stopped when it came to this horrible crime and Rebecca. I believe that Rebecca held on to that frame of mind the entire trial as well. From the moment she was facing police that night all the way, maybe even now as we speak, as she's being incarcerated, she might still have that thought process going through her, like trying to find a way to just fix everything. Because she insinuated in learning that people were hurt that, you know, her husband could help them. My husband's a part of this, you know, he can, he can fix it, you know? Just kind of uh, this attitude of ignoring what was really happening, like people getting really, really hurt. And once I get to the part where we discuss the injuries of the boys, that starts to just not even <laughs> be an option. I just think that Rebecca had this frame of mind that she could weasel her way out of almost anything. Like maybe she could even buy her way out of this and use endless excuses to not go to prison, let alone become responsible for the crime. While other people were mourning all these years, Rebecca has taken almost all this time to fight her way out of accountability. The ACORN released an article on October 22nd of 2020 that the people involved are not only people of high standing in the community, but they apparently made the singular decision to drink and drive after clearly knowing the danger of what might happen. Which as I understand it, that's what summed up the disappointment of it all. The entitlement that seemed to carry on throughout the entire case. Through that experience, Nancy Iskander, the boy's mother, was then left to plead and fight for justice alongside her husband and the community for Mark and Jacob against this socialite who was out on a $2 million bail. Like they would not even publicize her mugshot. It really appeared like the desperation of this family to get justice were up against a huge giant with money. Also, alongside this information of realizing that she was out on a $2 million bail and that her mugshot wouldn't be shown, the attorneys for Rebecca Grossman furthermore asked the judge to bar media and the public from Rebecca Grossman's preliminary hearing that was set for April. Now, I did not actually know this before, but Rebecca apparently wrote an article in 2019 about a friend of hers that had been paralyzed in a car crash. Also, Rebecca had attended a 2018 Mercedes AMG Academy, which is said to be an intense, high-speed, 
high adrenaline experience, providing thrill seekers the chance to push themselves and Mercedes AMG vehicles to their limits. The judge said exclude the magazine article that was written by Rebecca, and the judge also said they would exclude the AMG Academy from the courtroom, but what was allowed to be used was the ticket that Rebecca received where she was going 92 miles per hour on the freeway back in 2013, which I also covered in part one. If you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, really, you should go hear it because we cover an in-depth detail about this specific part where when she was pulled over, how her frame of mind was back then. And it really did not seem to teach her any lessons. She really doesn't seem, in my opinion, like she learned anything. I mean, literally besides the obvious, just the way that she spoke to authorities when he was handing her that ticket after going 92 on a freeway. It was pretty insane. Additionally, prosecutors indicated that Rebecca Grossman had received four speeding tickets between 2000 and 2020. So it is very safe to say that Rebecca really never learned at all. And if you're the one getting tickets left and right, let that be a learning lesson for you too, because as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, it's it's that frame of mind that, you know, if I go a little fast to get from point A to point B, you may not be paying attention. Like you don't actually have to be drinking and driving. You could be on your cell phone. You could be distracted with the radio. Maybe your kids are needing your attention in that moment. Like I personally understand that. But when you hear of a story like this, you're just kind of like blown away. It, it makes you really think about driving records and the people that are around you, let alone yourself, if you're continuing to get tickets. Obviously, Rebecca Grossman did not take any of that very seriously. So for the last few years, it has put this family, the Iskanders, through an immense amount of grief to wait for the day that there would be justice for Mark and Jacob. So finally, by 2024, Rebecca Grossman was facing trial. We discussed some of the prosecution side, and we also discussed some previous witnesses testifying in her preliminary hearing in the past. The prosecution had finished presenting the evidence, leaving the defense side to fight for justice on behalf of Rebecca, which began in February of 2024. So during the trial, the defense went very hard for Rebecca in proving her innocence and it got hairy. Tony Busby was absolutely ruthless on everything that was thrown against his client, Rebecca. He, this guy had an answer for everything. Tony Busby disputed that the data used by the prosecution's expert from Rebecca's black box within her Mercedes was not reliable. Tony Busby, this is her defense attorney, by the way, had called in experts who testified that the data was not reliable and that Rebecca was traveling 52 miles per hour based on a video captured seconds after the collision. Tony Busby also maintained that Rebecca Grossman didn't leave the scene and accused law enforcement of failing to adequately investigate the crash, saying it was not the best investigation that you've ever seen. Under cross-examination, the officer who administered Rebecca Grossman's sobriety test, Deputy Michael Kelly, admitted that not all of it was done according to the book, with some steps skipped or rushed and certain instructions omitted. The video of the test was shown to the jury more than once. However, Jurors were able to hear from Detective Michael Takix, which we've talked about him in part one as well, who works as an investigator for the district attorney's office and has extensive DUI experience. Dr. Takix testified that based on the entire picture, there was still reason to believe that the driver, Rebecca, was impaired, even allowing for mistakes made by the officer at the scene that night. In part one on my content, we covered how she had a cocktail and there was a witness that mentioned that they saw her drink just one cocktail. She got behind the wheel and was later found with her system. However, that couldn't be proven that she took it while she drank because Valium can stay in your system for many days after you have one. Tony Busby insisted that a separate vehicle, Scott Erickson's, went through the intersection two and a half seconds before Rebecca Grossman. The defense for Rebecca told jurors that they were going to prove that Scott Erickson's car hit the Iskander brothers first and that seconds later, 
the two boys would be hit by Rebecca Grossman's car as she was close behind. Scott Erickson was previously charged with misdemeanor reckless driving, but the charge was dismissed after he finished a diversionary program. Originally, the police were said to have taken Scott's word over the phone about the accident and that errors in the investigation led Rebecca's defense to defend Rebecca declaring this investigation was not handled properly. And that was pretty much what it all came down to for the defense entirely, that Scott Erickson was the alleged murderer, not Rebecca. But you know, hey, these are some big holes in the investigation. Like it, it would probably get a lot of people to second guess putting this woman away because if it wasn't properly investigated and that's what the jurors had to work with and witnesses, it's like, dang, that's some pressure. And then you're in there hearing Tony Busby say, we will show you that Scott's vehicle is the vehicle that hit the two children first. He accused investigators of rushing to judgment to accuse Rebecca Grossman of killing the boys when reality, the car in front of hers was the one that hit the children first. What a position to be put in as well. If you think about it, you don't want to be sloppy with this because lives are at stake. And you're already hearing that people didn't handle the case properly. So now it's really on for the jury. Tony Busby went on to say the evidence would show that the children were not in the crosswalk, which he said was improperly marked when they were struck. Let's talk about that for just a moment. According to Law and Crime, Tony Busby noted that the Iskander family have sued the city of Westlake and the state of California, alleging that the crosswalk was a substantial factor in the deaths of their sons. Tony said, it is now clear that one of the primary causes of the accident in this case was the dangerous aspects of the pedestrian crossing where this occurred. Our Freedom of Information Act requests have revealed that despite multiple complaints from concerned citizens and many near misses, Westlake Village refused on multiple occasions in 2014, 2017, 2018, and 2019 to make the crossing safe. Allegedly, there was a push to add either a stoplight or flashing lights to the crossing. So Tony just jabs it right in. He says, it is ironic that the Iskander family not only sued the city of Westlake, but also sued the state of California for their son's death. The same entity that now is attempting to prosecute Mrs. Grossman. He said, it is unfathomable to me how the state thinks it can prosecute someone while it is at the same time being sued for recklessness and negligence for the very same incident. Tony Busby is a bulldog, y'all. Like, I'm not kidding. This guy has an answer for everything. Tony Busby also denied contentions that Rebecca Grossman left the scene, saying she was so close to her home that she could have gotten out of her car and walked home if she really wanted to flee. Tony Busby alleged that Scott Erickson stopped up the road, he hid in the bushes, and he just watched after the collision. Now, I don't know about you, but in hearing all of this, it would be really difficult to take a prosecution side if I was hearing that the investigation was sloppy and that Rebecca was caught in the middle of this incident while an actual potential killer was getting away with murder as he stood by and watched his girlfriend take responsibility. Like, we have to be fair here. If this case wasn't handled appropriately on scene, it can screw with your head a bit in the deciding factor of who's really responsible for this crime. I personally have always read crime cases and gone to the source, which was the victim's mother. And I listen first. It's really easy when you're reading this stuff in different articles, especially something that carries on for years and years, to just start taking sides and jumping to conclusions based on how the writer gives off the information. And sometimes that information isn't even accurate. So I like to just kind of kick back and listen. And I definitely go off of the mother. I just think moms, they just know. And that was actually one of the reasons that I personally stood steadfast with Nancy's in a of Rebecca being fully guilty. But you've got this insane story from Tony Busby that's got you thinking like, oh my God, like what if? Then he says, use your courage and find Mrs. Grossman not guilty. Every time I heard Nancy speak publicly, it was like finding my way home again. Something about this woman's spirit indicated honesty and integrity, and she kept that the entire 
time. It wasn't just another crime story about a mourning mother chasing justice. Nancy was about the truth from day one. And look, I never really got that from Rebecca's side. So that said, January 29th, KNX News reported that Nancy Iskander took the stand and she relived the moment in her testimony by stating, when she realized cars barreling down the street were not slowing down, she grabbed her youngest son, who was closest to her, and dove out of the way. When Nancy looked back, she saw a white SUV going through the intersection, and her two other sons were no longer there. Nancy Iskander said the car's driver kept going and things became quiet. She found eight-year-old Jacob lying on the ground nearby, but she could not see 11-year-old Mark. Nancy Iskander testified that once she found Mark, she could see that he had blood coming out of his mouth and that every bone in his body was broken. She said she knew Mark had died. I just wanna stop for a minute and honor Nancy and just the whole support system to this family, you know? I have two children. She's a woman of faith. I'm a woman of faith. This is a hard story to tell actually, because I honestly can't imagine how hard this has been on the Iskanders. So before we go any further, I'm leaving a link to their GoFundMe on my channel down below. And also, I'm just letting you know, my channel is actually going to be donating in the month of March for the incident that happened to help support the Iskanders with their goals in remembering Mark and Jacob. And I encourage you to do the same. Even if it's just a couple dollars, they're running a program and it's pretty cool. Check it out. It's going to be linked down below. So going forward, Nancy Iskander acknowledged though that she didn't actually see Rebecca Grossman hit the boys, but she heard the crash and she found them harmed. She was later asked about suing Rebecca Grossman and she said, Yes, she killed my kids. They're not at school. They're not playing sports. They're at a cemetery. Autopsy photographs of the bodies of Mark and Jacob Iskander were shown in the courtroom on February 6th. Amongst the images were close-ups of devastating injuries, including severe fractures of 11-year-old Mark's right forearm and the bottom of his skull. Jacob, eight years old, suffered a complete dislocation of the joint between the skull and the top of his cervical spine. According to Dr. Matthew Miller, the pathologist who performed the autopsies, this would have instantly caused a full body paralysis. The cause of death for both boys was blunt force trauma injuries. In his opinion, they would have been knocked unconscious almost immediately upon impact. Mark's injuries were consistent with death within seconds to minutes in most cases. His body had been found 254 feet away from the crosswalk, an investigator testified. Jacob had a heartbeat and was taken to the hospital before being pronounced deceased. The injuries to both boys were consistent with a high-speed single vehicle collision. But in an animation prepared by the defense, Scott Erickson's SUV is shown hitting the boys and launching Mark high into the air with Mark's body then falling falling on the hood of Rebecca Grossman's oncoming vehicle. After seeing the video, Dr. Matthew Miller said it was unlikely that a car with the height of Scott Erickson's vehicle would throw a person up in the air in such a manner. During his testimony, it should be noted that Rebecca Grossman sobbed. She was crying quietly to herself as she was having to hear these things and look at the photos. Now, the boy's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Iskander, they've already left the courtroom by now following a word of caution from the Los Angeles County Superior Court Judge Joseph Brandolino about disruptions in the trial. It's said that Nancy was very upset and understandably, and had been asked to leave the courtroom. Nancy Iskander had broken down earlier in the day, rushing out of the courtroom during a testimony on the toxicology. The defense had made a motion to exclude Nancy Iskander from the courtroom during testimony by two witnesses. As a criminologist who discussed blood splatter on Rebecca Grossman's vehicle and Dr. Miller, the pathologist. Rebecca Grossman's defense told the judge that displays of emotion while completely normal and human can affect his client's right to a fair trial, 
by inflaming the passions of the jury and endearing sympathy for the Iskanders. So they were filing a huge complaint. They're like, this is a thing and it can't be a thing. That's what her defense was saying. Prosecutors pushed back, noting that the Iskanders had done exactly as they were told to do by exiting as soon as they were overcome with emotions and distress. It's a murder trial in the death of her children, Deputy District Attorney Ryan Gold told the judge. For the defense to say that she needs to be a robot and not have emotions is ridiculous. Judge Brandolino declined to grant the motion, but noted that disruptions, for a lack of better word, can affect the jurors. It affects the integrity of the trial and can affect the results. So that's when they told the Iskanders, basically when we get to the coroner part of this trial, it's probably inevitable that they're going to have to leave the courtroom. Called to the stand as the defense's first witness was Rebecca's husband, Dr. Peter Grossman. He said that he learned from their daughter about the accident, telling jurors that his wife was almost inconsolable, crying, trembling, and incredibly emotional when he picked her up from the women's center about 30 hours later after the crash. He said he took photos of bruising and contentions to her body the following morning when she complained of soreness and pain. He claimed that he had been in the car with her hundreds of times while she was driving. When the prosecutor asked him if his wife was someone that he knew to drive over the speed limit, Dr. Peter Grossman said, I don't have any recollection of that. Rebecca and Dr. Peter Grossman had been married since 2000, and he went to describe Rebecca as the engine that makes the Grossman Burn Foundation work. But he said the two had begun dating other people, deciding to separate within their own home. He also testified that he had never met Scott Erickson, but knew that his wife had decided to date him, saying that he had seen Scott Erickson's vehicle, which was described as a newer model black Mercedes-Benz AMG. That's kind of weird. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. He said under cross-examination that he knew his wife and Scott Erickson had spoken after the collision, but said he wasn't aware when asked if the two had maintained their romantic relationship for a long time after the collision. Dr. Peter Grossman admitted to having a good relationship with his wife during the currency of the trial, showing up to support her since day one. And so now we know that Dr. Peter Grossman and his wife were actually separated and he was aware that she had been seeing Scott. In part one, it seemed like they were having an affair. The push from defense that the investigation was sloppy very much continued as well in stating that Scott's vehicle went first, but under questioning by Deputy District Attorney Jamie Castro, the sheriff's deputy said he didn't find any debris consistent with a black SUV or any kind of black vehicle. In testimony on the prosecution side, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Deputy Rafael Mejia told jurors that he didn't find any evidence indicating that more than one vehicle was involved with the collision, saying that he only saw debris from a white vehicle. Deputy Mejia said he found Rebecca Grossman about three-tenths of a mile away, standing outside her white Mercedes SUV, which had front-end damage. She told me her vehicle was disabled by Mercedes-Benz. Deputy Mejia told jurors saying that the airbags had gone off and Rebecca Grossman told him that she hit something, but she didn't know what she had hit. In his opening statement, Rebecca Grossman's attorney alleged that Scott Erickson's vehicle went through the intersection two and a half seconds before Rebecca's and hit the two children first. He continued to tell the jurors that Scott Erickson stopped up the road, hid in the bushes, and ended up watching the collision, which we've, you know, covered that over and over by now, but that's really the story that it seems like the defense was running with. Like, don't forget, this guy went first, how about remembering that he was hiding in the bushes when they're saying the debris was only from the white? Just remember this was a sloppy investigation. Don't trust the black box. Under cross-examination, the deputy said he was not aware that a black SUV had gone through the intersection mere seconds before Rebecca did. It was acknowledged that the debris from the crash was found 50 feet away from the crosswalk and the deputy said he relied giving his estimate of the point of impact on the accounts of the witnesses who indicated that the victims were in the crosswalk when they were hit. 
Now the deputy said, you know what? I thought about it. I have considered the possibility that maybe more than one vehicle was involved in this collision with the boys, but I've ruled it out saying that all the debris was only consistent with a white vehicle. He said he believed the crash was caused by the vehicle traveling at an unsafe speed and added that he stands by that conclusion. Then they ended up bringing Rebecca Grossman's daughter to the stand to testify. Okay. Alexis Grossman, who was 19, took the stand in her mother's murder trial, telling the jury that Scott Erickson confronted the young woman shortly after the collision, threatening to ruin her and her family if she ever told anyone that she saw him that night. Alexis Grossman testified that she spotted Scott Erickson hiding behind a tree near the scene of the crash as her mother was being questioned by investigators and said, Scott Erickson ended up bursting into her home soon afterward and he was angry, he was shouting, why did your mother stop? Why didn't she just drive home? Alexis would go on to say that Scott's face was really red and that she could smell alcohol on him. She said that he was freaking out and that it scared Alexis that he might actually follow through in hurting her family. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Deputy Corey got it. One of the three prosecution witnesses called back to the stand during the prosecution's rebuttal phase told jurors that it would immediately catch his attention if he saw anyone hiding behind the tree or any bushes. He said that the Sheriff's Department was not notified about anyone hiding in the trees or the bushes of the area. So it's just weird, guys. It's it's weird because here's her husband giving her a huge amount of credit despite their marriage falling apart and what sounds like maybe Scott Erickson had been over to the house, Dr. Peter Grossman's house, to see his wife while Dr. Peter Grossman lives there. So I'm assuming that's when he saw the vehicle where they were separated and this man, Scott Erickson's in this other man's house with this other man's wife. And yet she's the engine that runs our business is what Dr. Peter Grossman said. I've been in the car hundreds of times and I'm not aware of speeding. And now her daughter's testifying that, you know what, I saw Scott that night. The daughter's like, I'm this innocent bystander just watching all this go down and I see this guy while nobody else does. He's just in some bushes and he smells like alcohol and, you know, suddenly he comes to my house and he gets in the house and he's all threatening me. Like, as if this all really seriously got past police. Like they couldn't even find any black debris on the road. And another thing that defense had ended up bringing up was the fact that Scott owned two SUVs, two bins. They had the same plates, which is illegal. They tried to bring that up as if he pulled a switcheroo, you know, uh, turning in that he drove vehicle one, but really he was in vehicle two, probably buying him time to fix vehicle one. I don't really know what defense was coming up with, but it's all weird. It's almost like the people that loved Rebecca the most and really went to fight for her, like in a way made it really bad. The only thing in my opinion that was really working for the defense was the fact that there was a sloppy investigation and that alone was kind of enough for them to try to push for her to be acquitted because they were saying that the evidence wasn't really matching to just Rebecca. But again, as sloppy as the investigation was, now you have this husband that gets on this stand and he's separated while she's having an affair that he knows about. And he's like, no, she's great. She doesn't speed. Meanwhile, she had taken that AMG class. She had a friend that got paralyzed through an accident. She's had so many tickets. And he's like, I don't recall. I don't, I don't, I don't know that about her. She's great. Like she, she runs our business. And the daughter's like, yeah, I'm the witness that saw him while this whole crime scene, this whole investigation is going on. And, and they're really trying to convince the jury that the cops are so bad at what they do, they missed this. It's a bit delusional. But really guys, what mattered was, was the jury gonna buy it? right? Is this really delusional or was this actually seriously something that happened and it was big time missed by authorities and the jury now has this pressure to either free this woman or put her away. Another interesting thing that happened was an alleged video leak to the media about Rebecca Grossman. Okay, so she allegedly asked for a business card from a reporter because remember she was out on bail. So every time she was going to the court, she was able to go home with with her family. So it's said that she asked someone for their business card. 
All right, suddenly this video from a reporter was said to have aired after admitting to having received emailed material during jury deliberations. That was obviously a disruption and prosecution, rightfully so, they jumped on this and they were like, yeah, take her away for violation. Revoke her $2 million bail. They thought Rebecca did it. And no, I don't think it's really come out who really sent that email, but it was in the defense of Rebecca during deliberations. But then her defense, who has an answer for everything, they pinned responsibility furthermore on the jury and said that the jury has been warned not to read or watch the news about the case. So... In their defense, how would the jury know about that unless they were violating that? So Rebecca was warned by the judge about the issue of violations and that the judge was gonna be investigating it. However, more interesting, nobody knows what's behind this and is like, ah, it still drives me crazy. So Rebecca gets up out of her chair and she blurts out, she's just like, your honor, can I put something on the record? And her defense is like, shut up, Rebecca, shut up, shh. And suddenly her husband's like, Rebecca. So that was pretty mysterious. So when deliberations began, it was pretty scary for the supporters of the Iskanders and people all over the nation regarding what the verdict was going to be. We're on our top story, that breaking news, Rebecca Grossman convicted of second degree murder and other charges for running down two young boys in Westlake Village. It was remarkable, Alex. I think a lot of people were thinking that the jury was taking its time because with five counts against Rebecca Grossman, they were going to have to consider each count very carefully before making their decision, but guilty on all five counts. In the moment, as the decision was read, one verdict after the other, you could hear the daughter, Rebecca Grossman's 19-year-old daughter, exclaim, oh my God, oh my God, while her son was sitting next to her shaking and sobbing. It was, it was heartbreaking, but at the same time, you recognize that the Iskander family is on the other side of the courtroom and they are finally getting some closure. In fact, here's a couple of comments from the Iskanders after they came out of the courthouse. This trial every day in court here felt like I'm attending the funeral of the boys again day after day. That's how it felt. And seeing the defendant and seeing the, the defense attorneys, it just was that bad. We have been waiting for a closure. We have been wait honestly, we have been waiting for Mrs. Grossman to apologize, to take responsibility. And uh, she, she, she just chose to fight to the end and, and, and it was, Heartbreaking to see the, the lawyers' lies and conspiracy theories, and, and I, I, I'm, 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 I'm amazed and glad that despite all their tricks, they couldn't trick our system or the jurors. Meantime, Rebecca Grossman was handcuffed in the courtroom. Of course, her attorneys asked that she be allowed to go home, free on bail, but the judge responded this way. He says, look, this has been a three and a half year process and she's been out on bail that entire time and it's now time for justice to be served. Of course, the Grossmans will appeal. The judicial system really showed up for this family. The jury really saw through the story that they were painting of Scott Erickson being the villain. It's safe to say that defense put up a hell of a fight. They were doing everything they could think of to prove that Rebecca was not responsible for this from the crosswalk not being lit properly and all the complaints to how hypocritical of this family to sue California and sue the community. And now they're coming after my client, Scott Erickson, how dare he hiding in the bushes and threatening my client's daughter. See, see her husband, he's, a, he's saying she's good and they were separated, like they're on good terms, she's a good person. All the way to trying to convince the jury, hey, she didn't even hit and run the boys, even though Oh, Rebecca stated, she's like, I would have been home, like done, home. Doing who knows what with Scott probably, if I if my bins hadn't stopped. Like she admitted that. And even her defense was trying to like overshadow that and say she didn't hit and run anybody. Whatever they could do to push full responsibility off their client, they took every avenue they could think of. The Iskanders finally received justice for Mark and Jacob. I can tell you one other thing, that the DA was speaking to the fact that I asked him that to get to that 
guilty verdict of second degree murder is difficult. It is a very high bar because you need to get to implied malice. And that's why he told me when you have a situation where she knows that speed kills and then she went ahead and sped over 80 miles per hour on that suburban street, he says that that's why the jury came to that conclusion. Nancy wanted to tell the Grossmans how heartbroken she was for them. She does not want the children hurt either. The Grossman children hurt either. And she was thankful to what the conclusion was of this trial. But at the same time, she realizes that the Grossman family is hurting. Yeah, I mean, you think about also, you know, how close the Van Nuys courtroom is to even the Grossman Burn Center and what a fall from grace for the Grossman family here. Let's bring in criminal defense attorney R.J. Manuelian. Were you surprised that the jury came back so quickly? No, I wasn't. Uh, it, from the inception of this case, I thought this may have been a second degree mur uh, murder because of the following facts, the totality of the circumstances. The, the erratic speed, the fact that Ms. Grossman actually admitted that she was trying to start her car back up after the accident, after the airbags went on. So she had an intent or an implied intent to, to leave. Um, she acted callously after the fact as well. And additionally, she had Valium in her system. She had a little bit of alcohol in her system, and the, and the jury just found that to be a callous action for her not to inquire. Additionally, I don't think Tony Busby's defense of blaming it on Scott Erickson, the former Los Angeles defense, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 player, was did him any good because uh, Rafael Mejia, who was the deputy who testified at the uh, at the trial, basically said they did an, an investigation. They didn't find any black SUV paint or parts or any indication showing that there was another S uh, car involved, which was what Tony Busby's contention was. So when you put that out there to a jury, the jury wants to hear something that sticks, not just theories. They want to know more. And in fact, uh, there was another officer uh, that was there um, and I think it was Mejia that said there was nobody hiding in the bushes like Tony Busby said. But Tony Busby made a contention that allegedly uh, the Scott Erickson hit the kids two and a half seconds before, took off, somehow did a U-turn, hid in the bushes and was watching the whole thing. It's just a little ludicrous from my point of view. It sounds like a real bad Hail Mary pass, as they say in football, and it didn't work. The Los Angeles jury reached their decision in a little over a day of deliberations. Rebecca Grossman is facing 34 years in prison. She will be sentenced on April 10th of 2024. <sighs> Guys, that's a wrap for the Rebecca Grossman trial. Of course, we're going to be coming out with the latest on what those charges are and how long she's going to be in prison for. That was pretty powerful. And this was a huge, huge deal to the Iskanders. And I honor Nancy and her husband so much and the siblings of Mark and Jacob. And just, I've said this in part one, just all of the pain and suffering that they have had to go through. And unfortunately, even though justice was served, it just like doesn't bring them back. And so they will continue to feel that pain and go through some suffering. But at least now they have that closure to where they can finally sleep a little better at night and knowing that their sons went to heaven and that justice is being served here on earth for them. In the meantime, thank you again for choosing Crime Light to deliver the information that had been put out there. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Stay tuned next week for another case. I'm Chelsea J. Crime Light out. <laughs>